And our memory text is from Revelation 14. It took me a while to figure out why this was the memory text for this week. But let's pray. Let's invite God to be here and let's get started. Thank you, loving Father, for all that you have blessed us with this morning. Thank you for uh, another day of life. Thank you even for the rain, even though it does not feel like something for which we must be thankful. We know that the, the plants need it, the earth needs it, and uh, it won't be long before California tells us we're in a drought anyway. So thank you for the rain. Thank you for all the ways that you bless us. And I pray that you would trouble the hearts of our people who are not here yet. Um, facilitate them if they're if they're running late if they're having problems i pray that you would make their crooked path straight and prompt them in their hearts that this is where they need to be even for a discussion such as this one so bless us we ask in jesus name we pray that it would be to the glory of that name no matter what is said and done here today and i certainly hope that by the end of this very long day every one of us will see you more clearly and be closer to you as a result amen we do have a funeral service this afternoon at four o'clock and so that is part of why this is a very long day today it's also a day where i get to talk non-stop till 1 p.m hooray all right well so uh the memory text is from revelation 14 it's verse 13 the uh very verse after the conclusion of the third angel's message and the scripture says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Why in the world is that the memory text for this week? Well, it's because, <laughs> because, the, entire, because the whole lesson this week is about resting from your labors and and your work's following you in your retirement years. Um, I really struggled with this. Uh, for the reasons I've mentioned, it's just not something I give a lot of thought to in my personal life, but I struggled with it also because I just wanted to know, like, why? Why is this lesson in the Sabbath school quarterly? Um, it struck me over and over and over again that they were appealing for your stuff. Did any of you get that too? Is it, is it reading through it like two or three different times? Um, the, I, they, they were stressing like, you can't take it with you. Uh, you have the control to set it up while you're still alive, but the state will take control if you haven't written it down ahead of time. And even something on like, I think the Thursday or Friday, uh, uh, yeah, I saw this at least twice. It is only logical then that when we are finished with what God has given us and have taken care of our family, we should return the rest to him. So over and over, I kept getting struck with this. Like, this is, this is a sales pitch. Morning, Joe. And then it dawned on me. More so than a sales pitch, why, why, why do we give an entire week to this particular topic? Um, and the sad reality is that most believers in the world today are of a certain age or older. It's a phenomenon that's really kind of new since my birth. Um, I certainly remember East Coast in the 1980s, everybody went to church. Whether they were really like a, a strong believer, strong follower or not, everybody went to synagogue on Saturday. I grew up in New York, lots of Jews over there. Even had a few Muslim friends who worshiped on Friday. And then of course all the Christians went to church on Sunday. And it wasn't till like the late 90s, maybe even the Bush Jr. era, where it's like suddenly it was okay to not be religious at all. And most, most people my age and younger are not really tethered to a religion these days. Um, I think that's even mentioned in the lesson, the, the, or maybe I read it somewhere else, but the nuns, the, not N-U-N like you're a Catholic woman, but N-O-N-E, that's my religious preference, is nun. That is the largest religious group in America now. No affiliation. 
And so this, whole, this entire lesson all week long is not just appealing for money and property to keep the church going, but it's speaking to the age group where most of the believers are, at least in the Western Hemisphere right now. So it made a lot more sense when, I, when that finally dawned on me. Hello, my goodness gracious, we have more people on Zoom than we do in, in person. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, Lee. <laughs> the rest of you do not have your cameras on, but I, I see your presence. So hello and happy Sabbath and good morning. All right. Well, let's walk our way through it. As people get older, they almost naturally begin to worry about the future, says the lesson. The most common fears are dying too soon, for which we have life insurance, living too long, for which we have annuities, catastrophic illnesses, for which we have health insurance, or mental and physical disability, for which we have long-term care insurance. Can you tell I used to sell insurance? <laughs> Once upon a time, there, I always had a, a product to sell you to deal with whatever you were afraid of. Yeah, but these are what everybody crashes into, and how are we as believers exempt from that? Or are we as believers exempt from that? I guess I'm looking at you, Joe. I remember, I remember your extended discourse about the nearness of the, of the return of Jesus Christ from two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, but I was impressed by how passionately you argued your point. Why is everybody else not? We are I mean, I'm with you. I am, I am in the church for one reason alone, and that's because I believe Jesus is coming soon. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Um, but that doesn't necessarily uh, exempt us from these fears, right? I think Jesus is coming soon, but I'm not a prophet. I don't know for sure. I believe it by faith, because all the signs point to that. But what if I'm wrong? Oh, you're not. <laughs> I, I mean, I know that. <laughs> by faith, I know that. But what if I'm wrong? What if I have 40 years of natural life left, but Jesus is coming in 50? This if word is a dangerous one. That's the one that the devil used. If you are the son of God. If, <laughs> if the, the Lord is coming, not the ways of God, my brother. That's I'm with you. Well, I, you, you walked in a little bit late, but I, I prefaced this entire lesson with how disconnected I feel from it because I just, like, estate planning has never crossed my mind. I, I firmly believe both of my kids' first marriage will be to Jesus in heaven. Um, and so it's just I spend 0% of my life thinking about donating my stuff to the church after I die. <laughs> I very much want to be in that group uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, who are alive and remain to be caught up together with the risen dead in the air to meet Jesus. Yeah. Nonetheless, uh, I am not representative of the bulk of believers in America or Europe these days. And so I believe this lesson is speaking to that group. I like the paragraph underneath the one that I just read from, the, the various fears that we face. Because Ellen White speaks to that and says, all of these fears originate with Satan. If they would take the position which God would have them, their last days might be their best and happiest. They should lay aside anxiety and burdens and occupy their time as happily as they can and be ripening up for heaven. Okay. So fear of dying too soon so that your family will not be cared for, living too long so you run out of resources, catastrophic illness that changes your life in a day, and what was the last one? Uh, disability so that you keep on living but not the way you used to. All of these things, says the prophet, are fears that originate with Satan. How do we feel about that? Pray more. Say again? Pray more. Pray more? <laughs> it, is Ellen White being dismissive then? Oh, they, they originate with Satan. Claim the name of Jesus. Satan can't stand in the name of Jesus. These aren't real fears. Somewhere in the writings of the prophet, I read that she says that the Lord is my insurance. So I refuse to buy insurance. The hospital I worked at, they forced me to have one. But if I had my choice, I wouldn't even have insurance. The Lord is my insurance. He will take care of me. 
Okay, amen. I have certainly known a lot of believers who feel that very same way. I got scolded once for talking about earthquake insurance. (laughs) You don't need earthquake insurance, Pastor. God will keep your house standing if the earth quakes. Yeah, Um, all right, well, but I still think that this leaves us in a gray area. Because are we to say that if the Lord is our insurance, that no believer ever dies prematurely and leaves their family bereft? The Lord has his reasons, but I'm not going to put a lot of my effort into that you know, area of preparing for the future. Because the future is in heaven. Why, why would I start buying, making payments on a 30-year house, you know, a mortgage, or whatever times it takes to, to purchase a building? If the Lord is coming within a few years... Dude, wait, that's bad financial position. It's actually a great idea to buy a 30-year mortgage because you get four years into it and the Lord comes. You got a 30-year house for four years of payments. Hallelujah. But you're still making the payments <laughs> every time. Anyway, that's my view. Um, all right. Morning, Gloria. <laughs> all right, well, let's get to the rich fool on the Sunday lesson. From Luke chapter 12. Starting in verse 16, I I imagine this is a parable that you know, you've read many times, but starting in verse 16, Jesus tells us a parable saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Say again. The antediluvians, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Eat, drink, and be merry. And that sounds very much like um, the phrase in, I think, Isaiah, um, where God is, is, he's saying this as an accusation against the people because they're saying, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die, right? And so there's just no care in their heart at all for how apostate they are being nor the fate that is about to come. They know death is coming. They're not in a repentant mode. They're in an indulgent mode. Yeah. And so Jesus is giving the, a very similar phraseology to this fictitious man, this, this rich man in the parable. Um, I want to have my ease and eat and drink and be merry. <laughs> but God said to him, fool! Fool! This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And usually when I have heard this story in the past, we go right up to the middle of verse 21 and then we stop. <laughs> so is he who lays up treasure for himself. Don't you know, therefore, you, since you can't take it with you, why don't you go talk to the, uh, the planned giving department of the conference? <laughs> that's usually how that goes. But that's not really what Jesus is saying, is it? So is he who lays up treasure for himself, comma, and is not rich toward God. So is Jesus condemning the idea of an IRA? I I really didn't think that would make everybody silent. (laughs) Is he condemning the idea of a 403B, 401K, retirement savings account? No, no, he's not. It's a smart thing to do, actually. All right. I want to hear more, Joe. Why is it a smart thing to do to have a 401K, but not a smart thing to do to buy a 30-year mortgage? Square that circle for me, brother. It is smart to have funds, you know, for a rainy day, no pun intended. But because of the circumstances we're living now, because of the prophetic periods being uh, fulfilled, 
in my heart, I know that the Lord is about to come back. So a 401k at 30 years right now, not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother purchased a piece of property down in Mexico, and he's planning to retire there. More power to him. I think that whatever funds he uses over there for the future, he neglects his family now. If the Lord is coming back really, like say, half a dozen years, you know, then the money is better to spend if you use it here. The story of the rich uh, ruler that, you know, made bigger barns, how he used all his stuff and give it away that day, he would take everything with him. Hmm. So where do you divide the line? I happen to believe that the Lord is about to come back. So I'm changing my tune of how I'm doing my things, how I'm living my life, you know. I'm reading more, I'm studying more. Every time I run into anybody, the Lord is coming. Are you ready, my brother? The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming more so than in the past. Amen. Uh, uh, again, I I'm, I'm want to hear from everybody today. Uh, most of you walked in after I opened this lesson with my preface. Um, this whole lesson seems very foreign to me because like Joe, I believe Jesus is coming very soon and I have given no thought at all to the concept of retirement or estate planning or, or anything like that. It's totally foreign to me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so therefore, we're I wanna hear from you about your perspectives if they're different from mine. Um, we have talked about how uh, we should make financial choices in light of the soon return of Jesus Christ. We've also talked about the prudence of planning nonetheless. For example, the way that I think about this generally is like um, Joseph of Arimathea. Who's that character? What did he do? Uh, yes. How? He used all his money to f further the cause of the Lord. And the Lord didn't come back right away, but he became poor because of it. But in the process of becoming poor, he became really rich spiritually. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Joseph of Arimathea, we meet him in Matthew 27. And this is the man who in verse 58 went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Now, why was it a big deal to have a tomb hewn out of rock at that time? Earthquakes. Okay, but did everybody have a tomb hewn out of rock? That was for the rich. Yes and yes, that was a rich person's way to be buried. A poor person's way to be buried, they had common graves, Right? You just throw the corpses. Some of them, the criminals wouldn't even get a grave. They'd throw them in Gehenna and burn them up. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> probably not in that society, but sure, yeah. And so here comes this rich dude. And he donated his, his riches. I mean, by that point, the language implies he had already spent the actual capital for the tomb. But now that he has the tomb, he donates it to Jesus, so that Jesus can have a royal burial, yeah, a rich there. person's he, burial. He, he can get back later anyway, right? Uh, yes, indeed, but Joseph didn't know that. And my point is only that if all of us walk forward completely destitute because Jesus is coming soon, so therefore we never have any storehouse of treasures for ourselves, who's gonna be the Joseph of Arimathea? Did the, resurrect, did the death and resurrection story not hinge upon a rich person using his resources to intervene on that situation? Joseph of Arimathea intervened for Jesus' behalf several times in the past. It's just that he concealed his allegiance to him out of a fear that the uh, leaders of the, you know, of the Jews would take represalias against Jesus. But as soon as he finds out that Jesus was dead, then he didn't care and he boldly goes out 
can do all the stuff that you just mentioned. So it is my duty, although I'm not as, you know, like uh, Joseph Amaya Mattia, you know, I have my reservations, but if I know the Lord is coming, you know, I should put my entire influence on it. I get scolded by it, believe me. Uh, my mom kicks me over the head with a stick because Josh, this the Lord is coming thing so much, you know. He's coming fine, but try not to make, try not to steer the boat too much, you know. And you know, I'm here sitting in here, and I hear you telling me, and I don't know who else, but you know, it's only a few of us at 9:30. So the rest of them, I'm sorry, but the prophet says that um, punctual attendance to regular uh, 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 meetings, you know, it gauges the warmth spiritually of our church. I cannot feel that we are cold. I'm sorry. But the Lord is coming. Amen. <laughs> yes, amen. You were on a good sermon there. I didn't want to interrupt you. No, amen. I, I certainly believe that. The Lord is, in fact, coming soon. And that's why we're here, right? That's why we give up our Saturday mornings, because we recognize it's not our Saturday morning. It's a day that belongs to the Lord, who is, in fact, returning soon. That's not because he's returning soon, though. Even if he was not to come back soon, I will still give him my Sabbaths. That's regardless. Yes, that's true. Um, and, the, and the Jews have been for millennia doing that exact thing. But we're in the Seventh-day Adventist church, my brother. This, this church exists for one reason, and that's because Jesus is coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. All right, well, so the rich fool. What was the problem of the rich fool? He accumulated all of his stuff for himself he did not have any um, consideration for the cause of God or God himself, was not rich toward God. And this, I think, is a good place to insert this idea that in all of Scripture, from cover to cover, you only have the concept of retirement one time. Who is allowed to retire in the Scriptures? Do you know? Yes, the priests. That's correct. The priests had a certain period of service and then they retired. That is the one job in the scripture that has a built-in retirement. Nobody else was given that luxury. Everybody else works until they die. <laughs> so the concept of retirement as a whole is a modern Western concept where I'm just going to work until I reach a certain point and then my company you know, has given me a pension. Who gets a pension anymore? Nobody gets a pension anymore. My mother got a pension. But yeah, nobody else gets a pension. So we're, we're, we're funding our 401ks, our 403bs, our IRAs, our SEP IRAs, or whatever it is that we're funding. And then when we hit 65 or 70, we decide that we're done. That is not a scriptural model. Let me tell you the ways that that unscriptural model is harming the church. And I don't mean this church in particular, I just mean broadly. Um, when the older folks who serve the church for their whole lives reach a point where they decide it's not their job anymore, the church dies. Did you know that? Well, sure, but, but, but even, I'm not even talking about money. Yeah, I, with the money, you're right. But even in a church setting where all the older folks show up and return a faithful tithe and do offerings, but then that's all they do, the church still dies. That's what I'm talking about. Even, even bigger than money. When the older folks decide it's not their job anymore, the church dies. And it may not fe seem that way because you're thinking like, well, it isn't my job anymore. It's the younger people's job. I'm passing the torch to the next generation but the next generation almost never wants to do it absent of the guidance and help from the older generation. So when the older generation quits, everybody quits. And are we not seeing like the slow death of the church right now? <laughs> Our membership is plummeting. Luckily not here. I mean, this is like the exception to every rule I'm talking about, but broadly, membership in the church is plummeting, revenue is plummeting. The church is thriving. Yes. It's an offshoot of the main church, you know, and I'm pitching in to help them out because, you know, they, 
it seems to me, you know, that they're really looking for the Lord and more converts are coming into them. And so the little temple they had is not enough. And so they build another one. And it's opposite to what we're experiencing here. Absolutely. Yeah, Mexico, South America broadly, Africa broadly, um, many places in Asia on fire with the gospel. Yep. You're, I think that probably for the sake of time, I should not get started on that. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to agree with everything that both of you are saying and add on top of it. You know, I, I actually don't know this for certain, but my guess is that neither Mexico nor any country in Central or South America nor any country in Africa has as robust a social safety net like Social Security as we do here. Is that correct? Yeah, and so do you see, right? When a society decides it gets to retire, the whole society dies. Other societies where you don't get to retire, they thrive because everybody keeps working until the Lord puts them to sleep. Yeah, they have to. Or, they, or they're so family oriented so that when I reach an age where my body doesn't function and I can't do that anymore, I'm with the rest of my family who, who support me. And so, yeah, and so we have atomized, A-T-O-M, atomized life in America, in Europe, in these Western countries so much where I don't live with my mom, I don't live with my kids, I live all by myself, you know, <laughs> and, and I rely on the government to take care of me. But this is the way the society dies. I wouldn't, but my mother, since I was a kid, has insisted that we... She, she bought long-term care insurance when she was in her 40s and she, you know, she paid for it and yeah, and she wants us to stick her somewhere so that we can enjoy our lives while she slowly dies. Isn't that gross? I, I'm with you. I have been fighting this since, my, since I was a teenager. But. As a nurse, I've seen a lot of older folk really hurting bad for the lack of company. Uh, their, side, their, their relatives, they just come and see them at all. They yeah. lie alone. It's a sad thing to still watch. Indeed. Yeah. And so to a certain extent, like if I'm, I'm harping on the, the whole problem of the concept of retirement, and yet this entire lesson is what do you do once you retire? Mm -hmm. yeah, you see that? It's, it's like I just feel disconnected from the, the thrust of this message here. Um, what I'm about to say is not financial advice, okay? Everybody has to make their own decisions. But I, in my individual personal heart, I believe so strongly that Jesus is coming soon that I haven't, because of the, the nature of my job, I get certain tax benefits that most people do not. I haven't, I haven't contributed to Social Security in like five years. Ever since the moment I was allowed to not pay Social Security, I haven't done it. And the church got on my head, the conference got on my case. Like, well, you know, if you do that, then you're not building up and then you'll have less benefit available to you when you retire. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I will be in heaven by the time I reach retirement age. And or if that's not true, then the social security system is so broken, it's going to be bankrupt anyway. So <laughs> I'm, I'm working till I die, whether I want to or not. All right, anyway, you can't take it with you. That's Monday's lesson. If you invest it correctly, you can. Uh, uh, the scripture says, uh, uh, put the treasures in heaven. Put your heart there. You that, could. That's proper investment, isn't it? You know, investment is investment. It's maybe long term. After three years, you know, you give half of your check to the church. Maybe the Lord will have, you know, a balcony at your house in heaven. <laughs> I, I expect to have two houses I don't think there's a doctrine around this but I, the way that I read Revelations 20, Revelation chapters 21 and 22 are that there seems to be the New Jerusalem where we all get to live everybody's got a house there 
And then that's not the whole planet, is it? There's gates and they're never closed and the nations go in and out. And Isaiah tells us no longer will we build, but somebody else inhabit. So it seems like I've got a country home that I get to build according to my own specifications. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So um, all right, in any case, uh, yes, the treasures that are laid up in heaven, uh, you can't take it with you. This Monday lesson opens with Billy Graham. Someone once asked famous evangelist Billy Graham what surprised him most about life now that he was old. He was so old in his 60s at the time, apparently. <laughs> and Billy Graham's answer was the brevity of it. The brevity. How fast it goes. The shortness of life. The quickness of it. It does look like forever, right? You know, you go on a trip, you take your trips on a trip, and the trip is 10 hour drive. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the way back, they don't say that as much. <laughs> because they know the road, and so there are markers that tell you what the road looks like. It's not as far. But because we don't know exactly what the future holds, it seems so far away. But, you know, you can be almost in Portland, and you're going through uh, Grants Pass, and are we there yet? We're almost there. They just don't know that it's only a couple more hours because <laughs> they've never been there. But we could be almost in the New Jerusalem and not know it. Well, I think we're almost there. But, Amen. But, you know, I think that's why you know, it feels that way. Yeah, and and I this was just on my heart the other day. Um, I've been in California 20 years, and you know I'm leaving California soon. So this is like a huge era of my life that is coming to a close. What? It's half my life. I'm only 42 years old, brother. Yeah. I, and it, it dawned on me that, it, you know, when, when you're like a baby, you don't remember anything until you're three, four, five years old. And so it's like all those years don't even count, really, in terms of my experience and my memory. So in terms of like me as a conscious person with opinions and actions, I have spent more of my life here in California than I have anywhere else. That's incredible to me. Yeah, but, you know, when you're a kid, you're right. I'm, I'm 18 years old. I feel like I'm the king of the world. I've been alive so long. I'm such a big, mature adult. In the future, in the future, <laughs> years in the future you're going to be more heavenly than earthly. That's a really good point. We get, what, 80 years here? 90 if we're lucky? 80, 100, 100 if we're super lucky? For Adam, 100 million years in the future, all the redeemer are about the same age. Yeah, amen. Nothing at all like that. And like the song says, you know, as the years go by, we know less days in the future. Continue on. Did you know that the Talmud, the uh, Talmud is a collection of Jewish writings that are not scripture. They were written down like a couple hundred years after the life of Jesus, but they are considered um, authoritative by our Jewish friends today. Um, in most groups of Jews today, they look to the Talmud more so than they look to Torah, the actual scriptures. In the Talmud, they, it, the Talmud calls the time after the return of Jesus the time of no counting. Isn't that beautiful? If you don't hurt, if you're healthy, if everything is rosy, you think that they just keep going forward, you just got to remember the seventh one to come and bow before the Lord. Or every month to come and eat of the fruit of life. That's right. But what don't we count? In terms of time, we count everything, don't we? We count time so detailed here. I'm not making this up. I know when my sermon is going too long because you people react differently after a certain time of day. I'm not even kidding. If I'm still talking at 1230, I can feel it. It's like you start looking at me differently. Okay? <laughs> so... I'm, I'm just saying, like, we count to the minute down here. We count, we quantify everything You're down fine. here. <laughs> but the Talmud... Tal <laughs> and, but not for long, right? Talmud says we're reaching a point soon, I believe, where we're not going to count time at all. Amen. Who cares about your birthday? Who cares that you lived another year when you've got an infinite number of more years? That's true. 
Yeah, I think the context of the Talmud is years, not days. But yeah, you're right. The Sabbath will continue on. How many Sabbaths are going to be in a year? Who counts a year? I mean, if if what what would be a year if we have free travel reign over all, the whole universe? What if I want to go hang out on Saturn for a little while? Is a year the same amount of time on Saturn? The prophet talks about going to some planet with the four moons, and I think it'll be cool to go and check it out. But you know, you stay there. <laughs> When I was younger, Pastor, uh, we used to live in San Diego. I used to visit the different churches in the vicinity, uh, Valle de la Trinidad, Tijuana, Mexicali, the different churches, you know? And there will be a month or two in between times that I will visit the next church. And when I go and visit that other church, everybody, and I mean everybody, was happy to see me again. And it was very joyful. I can only imagine that if we go to heaven and we go visit different places, it will be likewise. We should be happy to see new friends for the same friends that you left a couple, three months ago and enjoy with them. And then after a while, I'm going to go back to see the ones I left in the other place. Mm -hmm. It will be really nice. It was a really good time on my life, I think. Amen. I, I'm just, my only point, Joe, and I'm not disagreeing with anything you say, but my only point is that our concept of time is so much based on the earth. 24 hours in a day, right? 365 days in a year even 30 days or so to a month with the cycle of the moon. So how do I count that? How do I count time in the same way if I'm somewhere else in the universe without those movements of the body, the heavenly bodies? <laughs> I, th I think we're not going to care. The only, the only measurement of time I think we're going to care about is every seven days we go back to the center of the universe and worship God. Amen to that. Amen to that. All right. Um, so let's do some practical financial stuff here. Um, because Monday is all about what do you do with your stuff since you can't take it with you. And practically speaking, it talks about why you need a will or an estate plan of some sort. And I am hoping Christ comes where I personally don't have to deal with that. But if you, if, if you have stuff that you believe will outlive you prior to the return of Jesus, then there is one really important thing that you need to do, which is to put it in writing what you need to do with that stuff, what you want to do with it. But why? Why? That's because the probate laws are going to bleed your assets dry. Did you know that? Roger. Amen. And to some extent, this is what my father's doing because, you know, he, he's on his way out with Alzheimer's disease. So he, he made it clear to his wife, my stepmom, she's the executor of all his money now. He says, I can't take this with me. Give it to my kids. If they need something, give them what they need, which I think is a great attitude to have. And he has helped me a considerable amount in that, in that mentality. Um, but, okay, but from a secular point of view, you have a will, whether you realize it or not. Because if you pass away without having written your own will, the state of California has a will for you. And it's not a single piece of paper that applies to everybody. It is an idea that has to trickle its way through court for someone you never met who doesn't care about you nor your family to decide for you what happens to all your stuff. And even if the outcome of that probate decision will be what you wanted it to be, it still has cost a ton of legal fees and time to get there. So all of your estate is diminished by the time it comes out the other end of the court. So if you have any sense of stewardship of your own stuff at all to leave to your family, to leave to your church, to leave to whatever, then you got to put it in writing because the state will steal it if you do not. Just enough to get by, so I don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, especially if you have more than one heir, more than one kid, or more than one person to whom it goes. You only have one house, but you have three kids. You gotta put it in writing what happens to that house, because if you don't, those kids. 
the court is going to figure it out and the kids are going to fight about it in court. It's going to tear your family apart and still leave you with nothing. Leave nobody with anything. It is so important. Spend a hundred bucks, go see a lawyer, put something on paper and circumvent the state of California if you care what happens to your stuff after you die. Indeed. Yeah, probate is no joke. It's just a real deal. <laughs> All right, uh, Tuesday is begin with personal needs. So what, what do you, now that you've decided to put it in writing, what are you putting in writing? And starting with personal needs means think about your family first, okay? Think about the things you love first. Proverbs 27, 27 says, you shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household and the nourishment of your maid servants. And the idea there is that we should have enough to provide for our family unit, which the Bible is apparently including your servants. Yeah, of course. Your children, your spouse, yourself your servants, if that is the kind of family that you have. But everybody who looks to you for support should be able to get support from you. It's a biblical concept. But and talking about goat's milk, they didn't have no refrigeration, so it's talking about at least a year's supply, not too far into the future. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, there, it's really like for nourishment for the day. <laughs> right. The, the lesson goes on. How would we rephrase that proverb? Because we don't live in a society where you're, you're, you measure your wealth in goat's milk that spoils by tomorrow. Uh, so maybe we would suggest as a modern rewrite, review your financial records and determine the state of your affairs. Or choice B, do a balance sheet and understand your debt to equity ratio. Sounds really exciting, isn't it? <laughs> from time to time during your earning years it would be appropriate to review your will or other documents and your present assets and update them as necessary it's exhausting it's like a job 15 years ago or so my wife and I like right after we got married we wrote an advanced directive for what happens to us if we're both in like a car crash at the same time kind of a thing I haven't touched it in 15 years I've had two children since then I need to update this thing, but man, it's like, it just feels like a job, you know? <laughs> it was a job to write it down in the first place, and now I got to start all over and do it again. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <sighs> easier, to, in my opinion, easier to believe Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> Nonetheless, okay, you need to have these things written down. And the point of the lesson is remember the people who count on you first. Your primary responsibility is your family. So much so that do you remember the Corbin issue in the Gospel of Matthew? Do you remember that problem? Not even to the parents. Yeah. Well, I have to point out, uh, as I read this, it sounds to me like food and shelter. It doesn't talk about no cell phone or automobile for the kids and none of that. If they want that, they can go and work their tails off. And I think that somewhere in that statement is room to have a discussion as to our wants versus our needs. And, well, but I, mean, I think it's a real discussion because uh, at least the state of California has decided that this is a need now. So much so that you can go to the little kiosk on Robertson Boulevard and get one of these for free on taxpayer dime. That's how much the state believes you need something like this. You're at a disadvantage if you do not have something like this. <laughs> well, that might be the case, but my only point is there is at least a mentality, a state level mentality that has decided this is not a want anymore. This is a need now. So the world has changed to, to a degree. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can, but they'll, they'll charge you like two bucks. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need maps anymore. 
Do you remember what? Yeah, remember those crazy times in the 1990s when you print out seven pages of maps and then just start driving like a like a pioneer? I love my wife very much, but if she didn't have GPS, she couldn't make it to the grocery store. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. She turns on GPS to get everywhere. GPS, sometimes GPS takes you the long way. She'll go the long way if GPS tells her to. <laughs> well, all right, so, all right, we're running out of time, so let's get through this a little bit. Um, take care of your family and the people who depend on you. Okay. Then we get to Wednesday and this, the point of Wednesday is to uh, condemn deathbed charity. Surprised me as I read through it. Uh, but here, this is a good summary about halfway down the page. In the context of being a good steward in planning for death, one danger that people face is the temptation to hoard assets now, justifying that hoarding, justifying that hoarding with the idea that when I die, I can give it all away. Though better than just spending it all now, we can and should do better than that. Why do I want to hoard everything now? Why, uh, let me say that differently. Why don't I want to amass as big a fortune as I can now so that I can give it away later? Sounds a little bit like the coveting. Okay, how so? Till you die, that means what are you going to do with your money right now? Are you going to, you could be, you know, put it like through the bank. Uh, uh, the bank of heaven, or you could put it, you could give it, I don't care, you could give it to people. Hmm. <laughs> Here's an illustration. Uh, I have had the opportunity to serve congregations over the course of my career, and more than one that have a decent amount of money, like, you know, a million dollars or more in a bank account somewhere. It's not decent, that's a lot. Not, not when you're in the Bay Area. It's not very much in the Bay Area. <laughs> and so in, in every congregation I have served where they're sitting on a pot of money somewhere, the congregation grinds to a halt every time. Why? No, no, no. It's, it's because the only thing they become worried about is that money. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to preserve it? Every business meeting is about that money. Every evangelism uh, debate, do we have to use that money? Where are we going to get the money so that we don't have to use the big pot of money? Um, usually because of a real estate sale, like they owned a, they owned uh, their church building from the 1940s or 50s or some other. Why do they want to save it and not use it? Well, because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense, but I think that is what this, the, today's, the Wednesday lesson is getting, um, is, is trying to help us to understand. When we're sitting on a ton of money, the, the temptation is to focus on that money. Companionship, uh, if you don't have health, uh, if you don't have shelter, whatever it is, it, you know, is the thing that makes you think about it. If everything else is normal, everything else is cared for, and you have a chunk of change stashed, yeah, you're going to think about that all the time. Mm. But you should put things into perspective and put the first what is most important first. So uh, God, you know. I would love... A good point, though, about the money having it especially. Yeah, and I would love to say that what you just said is true, but I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen congregations let their own church building go to seed because they don't want to use all the money that they have to keep it in good condition. They're more in love with their money than they are with their own worship space. 
Well, <laughs> we might we might need it. That's right. I'm going to say something like this in a little bit in the sermon, but uh, I'll give it now as a concluding thought because we have to wrap up here. Um, in a church setting, when one of our members runs into uh, a problem, right? They, they whatever, they, they're behind on their bills or they have some sort of catastrophe, they need help. Well, what do we do? We call the elders or we call the board and we sit down and we talk about how much money do we have in our, in our needy persons fund or our membership fund and where did it come from and how much can we authorize and do we authorize enough to get them through it or do we give a little bit less so that they feel like they have skin in the game and they don't want to become dependent upon our charity and all this stuff, right? It has to matriculate through... That's the wrong word, but it has to um, go through these like rounds of authorization and, and it's audited by the conference and all this stuff, right? It's a big deal. You walk your way into a homeless camp, most of those people will fall all over themselves to give you whatever it is that they have. You won't want it because it's... Yeah, because it probably smells bad and it's got some disease on it, that's right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's astounding. <laughs> I've got a hundred dollars in my wallet. You ask me for five and I don't want to part with it. But in that, in a situation like that, those people have like $2 in their possession. I walk in, I need 10. They will pull five people together to get $10 to give me. That's the corrosive effect that money has on us. I've seen that. It's interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. But you know the mentality that I thought, this one guy I saw, you know, he shares his tuna can with somebody else. And I thought later on, well, the day that he doesn't have the tuna can, somebody else is going to give it to him. So he said, doing it out of self-preservation, I don't know. But they are kinder when you don't have, but hardly any. You are kinder. But the same thing is true if you're not driving your car and you're on foot and you press the button to go across the street, you are a lot more nice to everybody else when you're on foot than when you're driving your car. You ever notice that? <laughs> same idea. <laughs> same idea. Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with, with this illustration here. I don't know if this is a real story or not. I heard it many years ago. Um, but the story is uh, at a prayer meeting one day at church, it's all the, the, you know, the regular membership. And then a man walks in. It's a prominent man in the community. And he sits down and they're talking about generosity. And so he tells his story. He says, you know, when I, when I first came to God, I had nothing, nothing to my name at all. And I heard someone call me to trust the Lord with everything that I had. And I only had $10 in my wallet. I had no job. I couldn't, didn't know where my food was coming from. But I said, Lord, I believe that you're going to take care of me. And I put that $10, everything that I had to my name, I put it in that offering plate and I gave it to God. And I said, Lord, I trust you to take care of me. And God has been so faithful. He has blessed me abundantly. I have more than I could ask or imagine. And I just, I'm here to say thanks be to God for giving me the grace and the faith to trust him with everything that I had. And then, hold on, Stanley. And then the elderly person in front of this man turns around to him and says, I dare you to do it again. <laughs> do you think you did in that story? <laughs> He did not leave his entire fortune at the church that day. He went home with his own stuff. That's right. All right, we got to close. So let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for guiding us through this, this lesson. It was tough for me to really connect to, but I pray that as we entered into it with honest hearts, that we heard your voice and we were able to follow your direction and your leading here. And I pray that um, we were able to discuss things that are going to stay in our hearts, Lord, in these last days when you are calling us to give glory only to God, I pray that you would destroy any financial idols that we have in our hearts and you would lead us in the ways of life all the way up to when we can meet you face to face and then beyond, obviously, into eternity. Father, teach us these lessons. Teach us 
the foolishness, the, 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 the folly of being in love with money. And for those of us who are in a position to, um, to leave some of what we've accumulated to the church and to the cause of God, I pray you'll give us wisdom to know what is the right thing to do and connect us with the right people to do that in a legal and efficient and profitable way for the kingdom of God. So thank you so much for caring about us. Thank you for giving us this wisdom. Bless us now as we transition into worship. We ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you.